So in the U.S. war with Mexico, I'm going to have many, many parts. This is the first part. And in the first part, what I want to do is I want to share with you and introduce to you what the entire uh, presentation will cover. Um, I will uh, attempt uh, first to share with you the common explanations uh, that are given for the war. Uh, that's what we'll do in part one. Uh, take a look at the causes for the war. Uh, try to understand uh, the opposition uh, in the United States to the war. Um, I will address some major campaigns um, and so, to, so as to appreciate some of the campaigns. And then we'll take a look at the peace treaty, the, known as the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, but we'll understand the peace treaty and how it came about. And then the racial attitudes that pre prevailed uh, in this war. <clears throat> I will address the significance of this war with Mexico and its importance for Chicano, Chicana history. Uh, and then there's the consequences. Uh, we need to understand the consequences of this war uh, for Mexico and the United States. Uh, let's appreciate this United States war because the war, when it's deliberated by Americans, is always portrayed as an extension of the debate over slavery versus free labor. Um, U.S. historians deliberately distort the people's um, experiences and they always couch this war in sectional rivalry. There's no attempt even by the most liberal of writers to look at the war in terms of human rights and its consequences to the people on both sides of the border because we still live with this war. Um, as the border is a testimony to this war. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll take a look at the consequences for both Mexico and for the United States. And then we'll take a look at Mexico's responsibility, how uh, uh, their role in ensuring that half the nation would be taken away from, uh, from them. And then I want to take a look at a very significant immigrant group that came, that arrived in New York during the lead up to the U.S. war with Mexico. Uh, they are immigrants, that, German and, and Irish immigrants, that are going to form a battalion and they're going to desert the American army and join uh, the Mexican army in this war. So we'll take a look at them. And then we'll address the significance of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So this is uh, part one again of the U.S.-Mexico War. Let's go to a film clip that helps us appreciate uh, the importance of this war uh, in uh, U.S., both U.S. and Mexican history. In 1846, near a border traced by a river, Two neighbors went to war. The fighting between the United States and Mexico began near the Rio Grande, then raged deep into the heart of the Mexican nation. From the shores of the Pacific to the Gulf Coast of Veracruz, to a final assault on the halls of Montezuma, Mexico City itself. In the end, Mexico was stripped of nearly half its territory. California, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. Land that transformed the United States into a continental power reaching from sea to sea. This is the story of a war that reshaped a continent and forged a new identity for its peoples. A war that caused wounds that have yet to heal. The war between the United States and Mexico. The soldiers came from every region of their country, from Missouri, Mississippi, Kentucky, and Maine, from Chihuahua, Oaxaca, Guanajuato, and Veracruz. They met at Palo Alto, Cerro Gordo, Buena Vista, and on other faraway battlefields, where men with names like Holloway and Smith and Page, Flores, Cano, Rivera, 
fought each other, and died. There were others who were not soldiers, ordinary people called upon to sacrifice everything to war. For Mexican and Indian families in the territories surrendered to the United States, there was a bitter consequence even to peace. Many would be made to feel like foreigners in their native land. In the late summer of 1848, a group of 15 Mexican writers, intellectuals, soldiers, and politicians gathered near the fallen capital to write an account of the recent conquest of their country. One of the writers was a young journalist named Guillermo Prieto, destined to become one of his nation's most beloved poets. Prieto and the others called their work Apuntes, notes for the history of the war between Mexico and the United States. For the first time, they came to measure their strength and to sustain the rights of the respective nations. These sons of two distinct races now meeting to appear before a supreme being, destroying each other in the new continent as they had in the old. They are a group of Mexicans who recognize that they have not done things well. But that the military defeat was not a moral defeat. That out of that experience would come lessons that would save the country, consolidate the country. In the United States, soldiers, journalists, artists, and historians published their own accounts of the war with Mexico. Some saw the victory as proof that theirs was a model republic favored by God. Yet others wondered if the conquered territory had come at the price of the nation's ideals. Thousands of returning soldiers, men like Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, and Ulysses S. Grant brought back experience that would serve them well against each other in the Civil War to come. But for now, it seemed that the war had forged a national identity had revealed what one writer called the native germ of the American character. America is the country of the future. It is a country of beginnings, of projects of vast designs and expectations. The bountiful continent is ours, state on state and territory on territory, to the waves of the Pacific Sea. One thing is plain, here in America is the home of man. Ralph Waldo Emerson. It was the beginning of a new era. The United States and Mexico would share a new border, would have to learn to live together as neighbors. Okay, I'm gonna be using uh, this particular film, PBS, it's from PBS. It was a, a series that was made in the 1990s on um, the U.S.-Mexico War. I'll be taking a look at the first segment a lot so that it'll help explain uh, the U.S. war with Mexico in part one. Um, when we understand <clears throat> this particular war, it will help us appreciate uh, at least the different dimensions of leading, leading up to the war. I'm going to use this first part of the documentary. Um, the war with Mexico is notable because it is uh, notable for a number of firsts, um, especially for the United States. It's the United States' um, uh, first foreign war. Uh, the United States has always been involved in defending itself uh, against um, any kind of intrusion. It always feared Great Britain uh, coming back and taking its lands. Um, but the United States is going to get involved in an invasion. It will invade a foreign country. Uh, for Mexico, uh, they will be invaded. Uh, Mexico will be caught off guard. Uh, it's the first war anywhere uh, in the world to be photographed. Um, 
That's the first war in which technology will be applied to war. Um, steamboats will play a very important role in uh, helping the United States invade Mexico, uh, especially Mexico City, uh, and take over California. Um, it's the first war in which newspaper correspondents are going to be uh, embedded, and they will regularly report from the seat of war. Uh, they will be sharing stories, so Americans will get to understand and appreciate something about what's going on during the war. Uh, it's the first war, as the film clip was sharing with you, uh, in which graduates of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point participated. Uh, among these were a number of officers who are going to later face each other across the battlefields of the Civil War. Um, this war, this U.S.-Mexico war, is sort of like the smoking gun to the U.S. Civil War. Um, and I'll share with you later with regards to understanding how it's going to lead up to the Civil War because when the United States takes over Mexico, uh, does the territory become slave or does it become free? Um, <clears throat> so what's going to happen is Robert E. Lee, Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson, uh, Braxton Bragg, Ulysses S. Grant, George Meade, George McClellan, William T. Sherman, just to name but a few of the people who will be involved in the Civil War will have experience in the Mexican War. Um, <clears throat> so let's go back and let's go to the documentary and let's appreciate something about how the war is going to be started. Mexican War was a clash between neighbors who were strangers, two republics born into separate worlds. One was a brash, rapidly expanding nation of 20 million, driven by democratic principles and transformed by new technologies. The United States was oftentimes referred to as a go-ahead nation, in quotation marks, a go-ahead people, uh, with the locomotive almost as a symbol this is all part of this boundlessness, all part of this idea of no limits uh, on what people can achieve. Meanwhile, Mexico's seven and a half million people were living a very different experience, rooted in Spanish and native traditions handed down for centuries. Mexico City, capital of New Spain for 300 years and of the Aztec Empire before that, had always been the cultural and political heart of the nation. Here, a university, printing houses, hospitals, and theaters had flourished before the pilgrims landed on the shores of Massachusetts Bay. The United States was born modern. They are already under the influence of the Industrial Revolution, of a capitalist system. When Mexico takes shape after the Spanish conquest and the blending with indigenous peoples, it inherits medieval European institutions, or almost medieval, and a deep history of native traditions. For the United States, to be modern is an act of natural evolution. For Mexico, to become modern means tearing down its institutions, destroying its social system, and changing its way of thinking. From 1810 to 1821, Mexico fought a successful but devastating war for independence from Spain. Some hoped to establish a political system inspired by the U.S. model. But the early years of the new republic were chaotic. The government was constantly undermined by generals fighting for power. In the 27 years between the revolution and the end of the war with the United States, Mexico would undergo 22 changes of administration. 
At its core, the country was experiencing a terrible crisis because it had lost its sense of leadership and political control, and this made Mexico extremely vulnerable. Fanny Calderón de la Barca, the Scottish wife of the Spanish minister to Mexico in the 1840s, described a country bound by the legacy of Spanish colonialism. Here, everything reminds us of the past, of the conquering Spanish who seemed to build for eternity, impressing each work with their solid, grave and religious character of the triumphs of Catholicism. It is the present that seems like a dream, a pale reflection of the past. All is decaying and growing fainter, and men seem thrusting to some unknown future which they will never see. One revolution follows another, yet the remedy is not found. Still they dream on. One of Mexico's greatest resources was land, almost one and a half million square miles. But the 10-year struggle for independence had devastated the nation's economy and decimated its population. Mexico was left unable to colonize its distant northern provinces. And the borderlands lay directly in the path of a growing United States. The United States had grown by purchasing land from other nations. But when the U.S. tried to buy Mexican territory, Mexico would not sell. For them, it was a matter of national honor, not just pride, to maintain the integrity of all of the territory they had inherited from Spain. Now Mexico worried that what the United States couldn't buy, it would take. The haughtiness of these Republicans does not permit them to look on us as equals, but as inferiors. In my opinion, their conceit extends itself so far as to believe that their capital will be the capital of all the Americas. Jose Manuel Sosaya, first Mexican minister to the United States. Two republics, bound by geography, yet separated by different histories and cultures. Few doubted that a showdown was approaching. Okay, so let's take a look at um, the causes for this war as the two systems are going to meet each other in battle over suzerainty of native lands. One of the things that's most important about Mexico moving into the north, and the United States moving into the west, and that they meet and understand uh, this place known as the Southwest today, is that it's Native American territory. The Native peoples live here. They are in the majority. And so Mexico is attempting to take over Native lands. The United States is taking over Native lands, and they come into conflict. And that's what Texas was all about, the Texas question was of course eliminating the Comanche and getting rid of the Comanche and getting rid of the Apache. And this is one of the reasons why Texas rebels. Now, United States and Mexico are going to come into conflict. So there's many different interpretations. Uh, historians um, uh, are divided in their interpretations. Um, historians look at the United States as being culpable. Uh, historians look at Mexico as being uh, culpable. Um, different writers try to take a balanced view, um, but despite the fact that there's no hard evidence to, to show a balanced view, um, there's many who are taking a look at the war and uh, different interpretations. Uh, let's take a look at the causes of the war. First is the Republic of Texas. When we appreciate something about the Republic of Texas, the fact that Texas gains its independence, well, Mexico's never, never recognized Texas's independence. Uh, the United States did. The United States did. So um, 
Texas, uh, there's a problem in Texas history. Uh, one of the things is whenever you take a look at, uh, at a map of uh, the U.S.-Mexico War and you take a look at this map, um, uh, it's these lands right here. Let me see if I can circle that this lands here. When you take a look at these lands here, especially in this area here, okay? That's the area that's known between the, the Nueces and the... Um, between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande River. Now, Texas, in the Mexican map, had always been uh, this... Let me see how I can eliminate this. Let's see where... I know that... Oh, there we go. Okay, good. I'm getting to learn this. This, in the Mexican map, this had always been Texas, the state, the, the state of Texas, but it was always connected to Coahuila. Okay? So, in the Mexican map, in Mexico, when Mexico gained its independence on its political map, this was Texas. Everybody knew it. Okay? But what's going to happen is when Texas becomes independent, Sam Houston is going to claim that uh, Santa Ana secretly signed a treaty with him that incorporated all of these lands here into Texas. So under Sam Houston's reign, <coughs> he's laying claim to this entire land as part of Texas. And Mexico is just going, well, we don't even acknowledge you. And Sam Houston, during his presidency of Texas, He's literally going to take a campaign of marauders and go into New Mexico, and he will be routed and humiliated and sent back home packing because as he attempts to, to claim, lay claim of all of this land in Texas. Okay? So when the United States annexes Texas, the United States is going to use Sam Houston's claim that these lands are Texas. And that's why whenever you see uh, the U.S.-Mexico War, you always see these lands um, uh, in a, on, a, on a political map. You always see this particular section right here on the political map because that's the, that's the territory in question. But for Mexico, Texas was always this land here, right here. This is what Texas was. And everybody knew that. But Sam Houston, again, insisted that Texas comes to the Rio Grande and goes all the way up into this region here. Okay, so that's the Texas-Rio Grande claim. So when the United States annexes Texas, all right, it's going to give reason, uh, uh, it's going to give moral justification to something that was totally immoral. Uh, when the United States annexes it, uh, it's going to be significant. Uh, in, in, in terms of, um, uh, of giving legitimacy to the Texas claim. And so what the United States is going to do in order to provoke Mexico into the war, this is disputed territory. Because when the United States annexes Texas, Mexico is going to say, what are you doing? You are, uh, uh, we don't even acknowledge Texas independence and you're already taking Texas from us. And so for, for, for Mexico and Mexican diplomats, this was, a, this was war. This was a, a, an act of war. The annexation was an act of war. But the United States hasn't declared war yet. So the United States, is, uh, President Polk is going to send uh, General uh, Zachary Taylor to go and establish uh, a military in Corpus Christi, which is still in Texas territory, traditional Texas territory, and will uh, then begin to, uh, once, once he organizes the military, uh, will begin to, begin to go in and occupy the, the territory that is in question. So uh, let's go back to uh, the documentary and let's appreciate the intrigue. On a rainy day in March 1845, United States President James Knox Polk stood on the steps of the Capitol in Washington. There, he delivered an inaugural address intended to be heard not only in his own country, 
but in the capitals of Mexico and Great Britain. Since the Union was formed, the number of states has increased from 13 to 28. Foreign powers do not seem to appreciate the true character of our government. To enlarge its limits is to extend the dominions of peace over additional territories and increasing millions. James K. Polk had entered the presidency with a solid reputation as a congressman and speaker of the house. His wife Sarah had managed his early political campaigns and was well known in Washington circles for her intelligence and charm. By comparison, Polk was considered humorless and rigid even by those who admired the discipline he brought to his job. He had a very strong sense of duty and professional obligation and a very, very strong work ethic. As he was fond of saying, uh, I am the hardest working man in the United States, and few could really argue with him. Each evening, Polk would meticulously chronicle the day's accomplishments in his diary. Here he complained that his days were filled with office seekers, visiting groups of school children, tourists staring at him as he ate. Only at night could he reflect on what he had come to the White House to achieve. Polk's goals were influenced by his mentor, Andrew Jackson, whose philosophy of westward expansion had inspired a new generation. They believe that the government should open up these regions so that they, so that the resources there can be exploited, and anything that gets in the way of that exploitation should obviously be removed. The expansionist vision would be condensed into one of the most powerful phrases in American history, manifest destiny. It was a conviction that God had intended North America to be under the control of the Americans. It's a kind of early projection of Anglo-Saxon supremacy, and there is a racist element in it, but there is also an idealistic element. To extend the boundaries of the United States was to extend the area of freedom. This was, this was a, common, a common feeling. Uh, the model republic had certain uh, obligations. During his campaign, Polk had called for the annexation of Texas and the occupation of Oregon Territory. But on both issues, he faced the risk of war. Mexico had never recognized the independence of Texas. Great Britain claimed Oregon. But the first diplomatic crisis of the Polk administration would involve Mexico. In February of 1845, the U.S. Congress voted to annex Texas. For years, Mexico had warned the United States that to do so would be the equivalent of war. Mexican Ambassador Juan Almonte wrote to the U.S. Secretary of State calling the annexation of Texas an act of aggression. Nowhere in the annals of modern history can one find a more unjust act to rob a friendly nation like Mexico of so large a portion of her territory. Amante then demanded his passport, breaking diplomatic relations. The United States and Mexico were now one step closer to war. Okay, so let's take a look at the causes again. Um, and let's appreciate the different experiences. Uh, I need to the slide on Slidell mission. Uh, and the causes. There's the Slidell mission. This is the 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 uh, the slide before this the this, the one on on Slidell. I, I want to address another cause. Uh, this film clip shared with us something that's very significant: the manifest destiny. Manifest destiny that Americans uh, carry this exceptional character as they move west. The whole notion of the frontier that America is. Uh, destined to go out and tame the wilderness. The term wilderness is, is filled with racist uh, in, intrigue simply because the native peoples are, are out there in the wild and it takes civility to tame savagery. And so the United States has always had this notion of this exceptional character and so they will give, uh, uh, finally label it uh, as 
their destiny, that God willed that they go from one uh, coast, uh, east coast, to the west coast, that they go from uh, 13 independent states to a continental system, that God willed them. So uh, what, a, what a better way to, in terms of an ideology uh, as that one particular man was sharing with you, that one historian was sharing with you, that there was also an idealistic element. Well, that's idealistic element, again, uh, influences the whole notion of, of making America white, uh, the Anglo-Saxon supremacy. This is the manifest destiny. And we can see this in uh, another cause for uh, the um, uh, war, and that is known as the Slidell Mission. John Slidell is going to be sent to Mexico. He's a Louisiana congressman. He's going to be sent to Mexico to go and buy California. Uh, the United States, uh, they want to at least tell Mexico, look, we're interested in just taking the territory from you. Um, and so Slidell is going to negotiate through military threat. This was an affront to the Mexican experience. And of course, this is after uh, the United States has already annexed Texas. So this is a very aggressive Congress, this is and a very aggressive president, and uh, the whole notion of manifest destiny that uh, these, these peoples are, are claiming their superiority over the inferior Mexican race. And of course, the inferior Mexican race, when you recognize something with regards to uh, what happened with the Spanish and the intermingling of the races, uh, well, when you get two original cultural stimuli, their blood is as good as ditch water. And that was the attitude that Americans, Congress, are going to take towards the Mexican experience. Mexicans are mestizos, they're mixed blood. See, the United States didn't mix. The United States separated. The United States removed the native populations and they kept black people on plantations. They segregated and, and isolated the people of color. And laws were in place to prevent miscegenation. So the United States, they like to talk about their racial purity and hence manifest destiny. Well, Mexico was a little bit different because of the casta system of privileges and the intermingling and the creation of native peoples as Spanish-speaking workers eventually and as Mexican workers. So there's a whole different kind of experience that's occurring in Mexico as compared to the United States. So as manifest destiny hits, the whole idea was to go from one uh, coast to the other and take over this land because God wills it for them. So uh, this... Uh, idealistic element is something that the Mexicans cannot, uh, uh, in terms of Anglo supremacy, uh, they cannot uh, uh, avoid. Um, so manifest destiny comes. It's a nice, it's a nice uh, uh, ideology to implement, especially with regards to the annexation of Texas, because it gives moral justification to something that was totally immoral. Um, and so um, Slidell is sent to negotiate through military threat um, the buying of California. Let's go to uh, the film clip and let's appreciate the Slidell mission, another cause for the U.S.-Mexico war. In July of 1845, President Polk ordered U.S. troops to the Texas coast. Their mission was to defend the border with Mexico. Texas had accepted the United States offer of annexation, and Mexican troops were on the march north under orders to secure the border with the United States. In Mexico City, powerful voices were calling for war. Even so, the government of President General Jose Joaquin de Herrera hoped for a peaceful solution. Herrera had inherited a country left in shambles by Santa Ana, and the president was convinced that Mexico could not win a war with the United States. But with the nation in the grip of war fever, Herrera knew that his desire for peace could lead to his downfall. A scholar and politician, Jose Fernando Ramirez, saw the dilemma clearly. The struggle will be lost by the first one to speak about peace. And for that reason, no one wants to express the terrible word. Quietly, Herrera looked for a way to preserve national honor without going to war. He let it be known that he would accept an envoy from the United States 
to discuss the Texas question. Polk responded quickly. His choice for the mission was John Slidell, a congressman from Louisiana who was fluent in Spanish. But now the president's objective extended beyond Texas to the Mexican territories of New Mexico and California. There were rumors that Britain also had its eye on California. Polk instructed Slidell to try and buy it first. Slidell was told to remind Mexico that it owed the United States more than two million dollars. The claims would be forgiven if Mexico would sell its northern territories to the United States. Mientras el gobierno mexicano piensa que el enviado while the Mexican government thinks the representative, the special North American representative, is coming to renew relations and surely to pay or arrange for indemnification for the loss of Texas. For the North Americans, Texas is already a thing of the past. And the only thing that interests them is to buy territory. The one way to provoke the Mexicans into resistance was the way that Polk had chosen, that is to uh, present a, a strong front and bluff the Mexicans into resisting or into uh, yielding. In other words, negotiating with them at Cannon's point. Polk's instructions were leaked to the press and Slidell arrived in Veracruz amid reports that Herrera was about to sell off the Northern Territories. The Mexican president was caught completely off guard. He tried to put off the meeting with Slidell, but it was too late. He and his cabinet were accused of treason. Desperately, Herrera tried to save his government and convince his country that there was no honor in fighting a war the nation could not sustain. War with the United States over Texas is a bottomless abyss into which the Republic will sink along with all her hopes for the future. By now, few were listening. In San Luis Potosí, north of Mexico City, an ambitious general named Mariano Paredes watched as Herrera's government crumbled. Paredes was under orders to march north to the defense of the Texas border. Instead, he turned his army around, marched on Mexico City, and forced Herrera to resign. As the new president of Mexico, Mariano Paredes promised to lead his country into what he called a necessary and glorious war. Okay, so this intrigue continues, and there's many different causes. Now let's take a look at uh, significant cause, the actual uh, slap in the face to Mexico, Zachary Taylor, General Zachary Taylor establishing military occupation at Corpus Christi. The U.S. military goes in to occupy Corpus Christi, and from there they will plot uh, and plan the invasion of Mexico. And uh, the initial battles uh, will begin as once Zachary Taylor moves his troops into uh, 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 into the disputed territory where the troops will now finally go into Mexican territory, um, the disputed area that I was trying to share with you before. Um, and it'll be, there will be a skirmish known as Rancho de Carecitos of April 1846. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the skirmish that eventually will lead to the initial battle of the war, which is uh, the battles of Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma. Uh, the battles of Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma will take place on Texas soil. Um, many, many uh, Americans uh, uh, like to go and visit the Palo Alto battlefield uh, as a national historical site, which is located in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, it's the only U.S.-Mexican battlefield in the U.S. Uh, as part of the U.S. national park system. Uh, all the subsequent battles uh, in the United States, uh, all the subsequent battles are going to be fought in Mexico, California, and New Mexico, but uh, Texas likes to emphasize it. But uh, the, the, the Rancho de Carecitos skirmish is going to give President Polk the reason um, to invade Mexico, and that is American blood has been spilled on American soil. Uh, again, it was a lie, a political lie, but it was enough to galvanize 
the manifest destiny uh, notion uh, for Americans. Uh, Americans like to, get, uh, like to claim their racial superiority, especially at this time, and uh, war support will be galvanized. So let's uh, conclude uh, part one of uh, the U.S.-Mexico War by taking a look at the <clears throat> last cause for the war, the skirmish at Rancho de Carecitos. Dear Julia, everyone rejoices at the idea of leaving Corpus Christi. It is to be hoped that our troops being so close on the borders of Mexico will bring about a speedy settlement of the boundary question. I think the chances of a fight are about equal to the chances for peace. Ulysses Grant. On the 8th of March, 1846, with the Dragoons and Major Ringgold's flying artillery leading the way, the U.S. Army crossed the Nueces River, heading south. With the failure of the Slidell mission, Polk had ordered Taylor to take a position on the Rio Grande, called the Rio Bravo by the Mexicans, opposite the town of Matamoros. The decision was certain to anger Mexico further. Mexico had claimed the Nueces River as its border with Texas, but Polk had adopted Texas' claim that the border was at the Rio Grande. When Taylor crossed the Nueces, he was crossing into disputed territory. He was in territory that Mexico claimed legitimately as part of its own land. And if he went down as far as the Rio Bravo and crossed it, then he would be in territory that wasn't even in dispute. It was Mexican territory. In late March, the first of Zachary Taylor's soldiers reached the north bank of the Rio Grande. Across the river in Matamoros, a crowd of Mexican soldiers and civilians watched as the U.S. troops rigged a flagpole and ran up the Stars and Stripes. The soldiers of the Army of the North were angered by the enemy's insult. For the first time, that flag waved proudly before our forces, as if taking possession of what rightfully belonged to us. Jose Maria Iglesias. The U.S. troops set to work building an earthen and wood fort they called Fort Texas. And for three weeks, tensions mounted as the U.S. and Mexican armies faced each other across the Rio Grande. We are prepared for attack at any moment, often sleep in our clothes. Both sides appear to be always on the alert. We heard the Mexican horns and bugles across the river, blowing all night. Lieutenant Napoleon Dana. As more Mexican troops gathered in Matamoros, some European observers predicted a quick Mexican victory. Mexico's regular army was three times as large as that of the United States. But the ranks were filled with inexperienced troops, peasants and Indians pressed into service through what were called cuotas de sangre, quotas of blood. The army did have its elite, among them handsomely uniformed lancers whose skill on horseback was matched by their courage. But the army lacked a corps of well-trained officers, and Mexican military tactics had not changed since the days of the Spaniards. On April 24th, the stalemate on the Rio Grande was broken when fresh troops led by General Mariano Arista arrived in Matamoros. That same day, Arista sent 1,600 soldiers across the Rio Grande. At Rancho de Caracitos, about 20 miles from Fort Texas, the Mexican soldiers surprised a U.S. scouting party. The attack killed 14 U.S. soldiers and wounded seven. The rest were taken prisoner. 
The skirmish at Rancho de Caracitos was over in minutes. But as far as Zachary Taylor was now concerned, the United States was at war. The general sent a dispatch to Army headquarters in Washington. April 26, 1846. Hostilities may now be considered as commenced, and I have this day deemed it necessary to prosecute the war with energy and carry it as it should be into the enemy's country. General Zachary Taylor. Taylor knew he was in a dangerous position. His supplies were on the coast at Point Isabel. The Army's survival depended on protecting them. The generals set out.